Uh, for our next keynote address, we have Dr. Rena Biskoff. Um, Dr. Rena is also a longtime friend of the Collab AI program. He was with us back in 2017 as we were formulating the program and helped guide its conception. Uh, today, Dr. Biskoff is General Manager Germany at Intrinsic, a robotic software and AI moonshot from X, Alphabet's moonshot factory. Intrinsic is building software and AI platforms for intelligent robotics which is key to making robotics more accessible and valuable to millions. Intrinsic became an alphabet other bet in July, 2021. And before joining Intrinsic in uh, 2020, uh, Dr. Biskoff was vice president of corporate research at KUKA, where he led research and technology development for future robotics products, solutions, and services for almost two decades. Since 2004, he has been playing a leading role in European robotics by coordinating impactful European research projects and by founding and leading the major European robotics associations. Dr. Viskov, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you so much for having me. I, I hope you're not going to be disappointed that I'm here in my private capacity as Rainer Bischoff and not as an intrinsic person. I will. I will share a little bit more at the end of my presentation, but Intrinsic, as you know, is a startup with an alphabet, and we are still in stealth until 15th of May. So at the end, I, I will ask you maybe if, you, if you're interested in what we are doing to register for our first product keynote. Uh, but until then, I think I'm, I'm not allowed to share too many things. Okay, so, um, and I'm a general manager of Germany, as it was mentioned, since about two and a half years for Intrinsic before working for KUKA. And still at the same time being the VP industry for EU robotics, um, our European Robotics Association. And I want to share with you a couple of thoughts on the challenges in robotics and AI uh, from an industry perspective. So I always had very close collaboration with, with academia and with scientists. Um, but from an industry perspective, I think it's also interesting to see what are really the challenges um, that we are all facing. It was already mentioned in the welcome address that, of course, demographic um, developments are kind of the main driving forces now in robotics. Um, it's a globally growing population. We have more elderly people and a shrinking workforce. <clears throat> and this all requires us to produce more, more goods. And it's either globally or locally um, at the place where they are consumed. And there's also higher levels of individualization required for these goods that we produce. But still, people want to pay not too much. So they want to have it at mass produce costs. So these are all um, high challenges and they require a higher degree of automation. Um, still, producing these things also requires a higher degree of sustainability. So we all have to think about um, our environment. And what we would like to do is that actually not only the rich nations in this world are able to share the benefits of automation, but basically all uh, nations should benefit from it. So what are the consequences in the end? We are still in a globally competitive environment and robotics usage will increase. It will increase in the Western world, but it will also um, increase in the developing countries. And for all of these robot-based automation, it is uh, required to have a higher flexibility, shorter change over times between the different goods because of this higher individualization um, that I mentioned before. And you can see this from the statistics of International Federation of Robotics, actually, that the robot density is growing. And you see the, the number here from 66 to 126 uh, in, in just a matter of five years, the number of robots being employed in the industry uh, to manufacture goods, and there's still more potential. And um, the potential you can see at this graph. So this graph is showing um, robots used in automotive industries versus robots used in non-automotive manufacturing businesses. So let's take the figure of the, of the US here. So 1,528 robots are being used per 1,000 employees in car manufacturing. And in Germany, it's 1,395 in Japan and so on. So you see that the degree of automation in automotive is much, much higher than the degree of automation um, in non-automotive manufacturing. And another trend can be observed that in the developing countries like India and Brazil, but also in China, and they accelerated a lot with using robots recently. So there's a, still a huge potential for these nations to also employ more robots. So all in all, closing the gap between um, non-automotive to automotive, this presents a huge potential for, for robotics 
sales, um, but also from the developing countries towards the already developed countries. So really a huge trend toward using robots and automation and huge potential, and that's why it's such an attractive market. And you can also see this from the latest figures of the International Federation of Robotics. They have this World Robotics Reports, uh, with the, which is coming out once per year. So you have seen an, a significant sales increase by more than 30% to more than half a million robots sold per year. Still, the population of robots worldwide is only 3.5 million. So we don't have to be afraid that all the robots will take the jobs of all the people that are there. It's, it's just really a small population of, of robots that is out there. Um, you see more service robots, you see more consumer robots. And what is really, really nice, you also see a lot of startups really being active. So 12% of these 1,000 service robot suppliers uh, are startups. Um, and they were, this was the so-called baby boomer years for the startup companies. So many of those are really established by now. And that is, that is good to see. Also, of course, because of some gracious funding from, from venture capital firms. What is also very interesting to see, robots have been never as cheap as they, as they are today. So when you compare the figures to 1990, um, the prices of robots have dropped to about 30%. At the same time, the performance was incredibly increased in terms of accuracy, in terms of speed, in terms of payload. The programming comfort has been increased. There have been more sensors being employed and uh, better diagnosis. Um, at the same time, the salary has increased of, um, of the workers. You see an example of a uh, worker in, in Germany. So this is, this is also leading to the fact that we all need um, more and can use more robots. Um, at the, sorry. On the other hand, everyone's always asking for cheaper robots. That's only one fifth of the story because the system cost um, is about five times as much or four to five times as much um, of just the naked robot. So no matter what the robot manufacturers do, they can still decrease the cost of robots. But what we really have to tackle is the four quarters um, that are representing all the other costs that you see here on robot peripherals, on the system engineering costs, project management. So all this adds up before you can actually employ robots. Um, so the robot cost is just the tip of the iceberg. And that brings me to, to um, our comparison of industrial robots and actually cobots. So the cobots that you are uh, looking at here. Um, industrial robots are usually made for big batches and just with little vi variability in the production. Um, they, have, they are complex to deploy. They have a slow change over time. They require constancy in their environment. They are not safe without any fences or some other forms of guarding. The focus is on the robot when you want to um, look at in installations. They have a heavy and stiff design, and usually you have a big investment uh, and a much longer return of investment. Cobots, on the other side, are low volume, high mix production focus. They are fast and easy to deploy with a fast change over time from one product produced to the next. They are able to adapt to environments. They are collaborative and safe. Uh, and I, I put an asterisk here because usually a robot per, per se is not safe. Uh, I, I come to that in a, on the next slide. Um, you focus more on the co on a process when you're employing robots. They are lightweight and cheaply designed and there's a lower upfront cost and a faster ROI. So um, this means actually, cobots are not any longer just defined by, by the norm saying a cobot has to be collaborative and, and working together with a human, they are all these other characteristics which are used today to describe a, ro uh, a cobot. Um, so this is very important. When people are talking about cobots out there, they meaning actually robots that are easy to program, that are small, that are lightweight, that can be easily shifted from one place to another, not necessarily safe in the collaboration with humans. It's just about the size and, and how these robots are used and how these robots are being programmed. Um, and this brings me to, to the classification. I think this is also important. We touched this yesterday in, 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 um, in our sessions um, in this workshop here. So there's a couple of collaboration types of robots and the ones that are really popular, what people were thinking initially, what is popular is really the human robot collaboration on the far right side where the robot and the human are working together on one workpiece. 
this type of collaboration <clears throat> rarely takes place these days. So this is not really happening. What is happening right now, either robots are fenced, even the cobots actually, the smaller lightweight ones that um, uh, promise to be safe in, in working with humans, but actually it's more the coexisting. So this coexisting use case is the use case that is being <clears throat> most prominently used in the industry um, because it's just about sharing the workspace in a safe way without the need of a, of a fence. Uh, to the right hand side, I put a couple of things um, how you can ensure actually that the robot is safe, there are norms and the machinery directives to be obeyed. But most importantly, you have to do a risk assessment because the robot per se cannot be safe. You always have to think about what is the tool attached to the robot um, and what is the application at hand. Um, in Europe especially, people have to pay attention. There has to be a CE mark in the end for any application. And that is why it's also so difficult um, to employ cobots um, together with humans, because as soon as a minor thing in the application changes, you have to do again a risk assessment. And this is really time consuming and expensive. So people are talking about cobots, but they are using them in a different way. Um, so this brings me then also to the market. So where are these robots um, employed um, today? And this is a European perspective. Um, maybe let me start first on where you can actually make money with robots. I'm from the industry, so that's why I have to think about making money with robots. And this is all the verticals that exist where you can basically believe um, there's, there's some potential in robotics. Of course, there's manufacturing, and within manufacturing vertical, you can have production uh, of, of goods, you can have food production, you can also have SME-based manufacturing. There's healthcare where you can uh, employ robots, especially for therapy, rehabilitation, uh, for surgical procedures. In agriculture, there's a lot of potential for robots. In the consumer space, civil, commercial, and especially here in construction. This is what recently came up, I think, uh, around the world. And then, of course, logistics and transport, all the e-commerce um, domains. And um, on, on, this, on this arrows here is represented that in each of these intersecting points, you can actually make money with services by, by, uh, by developing and selling robots or just by selling technologies. So this is the, the, the whole spectrum on where we can uh, make money with robots today. And especially in Europe, we are focusing four application areas. Uh, this is healthcare, agri-food, maintenance and inspection of infrastructure and agile production. Um, so for this workshop, I think of particular interest is in the agile production, but there's a technology that is being used in all these domains, which is, which is the same. So it's, it's about sharing ideas, sharing about sharing technologies, um, and actually automating processes um, in, in many different domains. And this brings me then um, to robotics and AI. And maybe you have seen this figure before. Um, the, the governments around the world that sponsor these kind of programs, um, they believe that robotics is part of AI. So then this circle of robotics is actually within AI. And I'm, I'm trying to educate the governments <laughs> that this is really not the case, at least not from a roboticist perspective. Um, so you share something which, which I would like to call physical AI, but then there's still the, let's say, the theoretical or software-based um, AI. And maybe the example um, I like to give here is um, just imagine you have a, a six-year-old boy. Um, this boy can, no, let me, let me start differently. So if you, if you want to play chess and there's these um, chess computers, it's, so, it's so, so easy today to be beaten by a chess computer because the AI the chess computer has is so much more brilliant than 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 what anyone um, can think of. But if you, but this is this is the, the the digital AI I'm I'm talking about. When it comes to physical AI, when it comes to physical interaction with the world, um, we are even not there at the stage of a, of a six year old. So a six year old can go to a shelf, can take a, a, a box with chess figures, can open it, can take out the chess figures, place them on a chessboard, and start playing chess. This is a type of physical interaction with the world, which is still too difficult today um, for us. Um, and that's why I'm also not too afraid that robots will rule the world anytime soon. 
So physical AI um, is the very interesting part here, but there's of course a part uh, in robotics that has nothing to do with AI. And, and the funding agencies, I think around the world should think about not to lose that aspect um, of robotics. Um, yes, and in, in Europe, of course, it also means that AI is everywhere and, and robotics is unfortunately part of AI in the funding scheme. So what, what is also very prominent in Europe is that, that, there's, that we are saying, okay, we have to ensure that the safety, the ethical and legal constraints are never compromised. Um, and I think an important statement is really that robotics needs AI and AI needs robotics. So they are really depending on, on one, or chief, one of each other. And, and the key thing here is that AI needs access to data rich applications. So you cannot really develop um, AI technology without having the data from the field. Right now, there's no simulation system available that would simulate you a robot in its physical interaction with the world. The, the contact simulation is not good enough so that you can do everything in simulation. I think I would start getting afraid a little bit about the learning potential of AI systems if the simulators were much better, but they are not. So. That is why we have to provide AI with data from the robots that are working in the field so that we can learn. But this will take much longer than, than just in, in, in pure simulation. If you, if you think now about, again, from a roboticist's uh, perspective, um, these, are, these are the main technologies that you, that you need in, in robotics, human-robot interaction, perception, navigation, um, cognition, mechatronic systems development, especially mechatronics here is the part that, that makes a robot move. Um, and, and some of these technologies are truly unique to robotics. Um, what you should do in the future is to actually look at the intersections between these technologies. This is where the, where the innovation happens. Um, you could, for instance, take this as an example, cognitive mechatronics. Um, and the integration of the digital and the physical AI delivers actually what the robotics applications need, need in the end. It's the smart machines, it's improved productivity, it's a better understanding of the processes, greater customization, uh, reduced waste. Um, this is um, across all the application areas I mentioned before. Um, so this is common to, to all of them. And I think that robotics delivers a large part of the impact of AI uh, to us. And to give you an example of, 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 a, of a complex mechatronic system, and that also demonstrates that we are still not there yet in, in terms of, of the many challenges that have to be solved. If you just think of mobile manipulation, so where you combine a mobile platform and a manipulator, um, you're combining, let's say, very mature technology on the one hand side on autonomous navigation, and you, have, you gain a flexible workspace. And on the other side, you have very mature applications that are available just with robots. But now when you're combining the two to a mobile manipulator, you're also inheriting a lot of the um, disadvantages. But maybe first of all, talking about the advantages. So you have mobile robots with, with robot arms on top. Now you can actually um, work on a very large structure. This is a windmill section. Um, and if you see the vision of, of Daimler here, the robots in the, on the shop floor in the future, they will all become mobile, um, very lightweight, are still able to carry the chassis of a car. So it, it's really funny to see how the shop floor will be populated with these kind of robots and, and where humans and robots are interacting. So this is a, a vision for the, the year 2036. So mobile manipulators become more important, but when you combine mobility with um, manipulation, you also inherit a lot of disadvantages, um, or we can also call it challenges. And this is about the precision of these systems. So while a fixed manipulator can be easily handled, as soon as you start to add a mobile base under a fixed manipulator, you, you inherit all the uncertainties, the inaccuracies of the platform. Safety becomes a much higher problem. You cannot carry the fence around uh, the mobile platform. Uh, and fences are sometimes needed, especially when you have uh, high payloads. Uh, Human-robot collaboration is much more difficult because humans can just walk behind the robot or they don't know how the arm is moving. Um, when the robot is just standing in front of, a, let's say, a workstation like this, and the robot can reach like this, 
over um, the human on the other side could do the same thing. And the human cannot be detected unless I have a supervisory system on top or not just the laser scanners at the body. Um, system complexity is, is or oh, uncertainty in the environment is getting um, much higher when compared to a stationary robot. System complexity is much higher. You have many more motors in the system, eventually also many more uh, sensors. When you think about a true mobile manipulation, and I'm not talking yet about humanoid robots, uh, Giorgio, so humanoid is even much more complicated in that sense than, than just a mobile manipulator, right? Um, modularity becomes a problem, system integration, the price of the system. So you have to think about now you have suddenly a mobile platform and you have an arm, and both of them have to be justified. They have to have a return of invest. Um, and that is getting much more complicated because either the platform stands still or the arm stands still. Um, so how do you justify this? Performance becomes a problem because, as we said before, the, the uncertainty in the environment is much higher. So the processes get slower. And now the thought experiment, Giorgio, for you, just for you. Humanoid robot um, for a human adept work environment. So is this really a good idea? Um, we all think about it, that we need humanoids to be able to work in human uh, adapted environments. So you have robot arms with seven joints, two actually. That makes it already quite complex. But even more so, you have the fingers. And you mentioned that the fingers were one of the major achievements uh, of the uh, ICAP. With 20 joints and multiple integrated sensors, also very difficult. Um, you have a pen, pen tilt roll unit, actually. So most of the humanoid robots, I know they, they don't have this roll, they, they just have pen tilt. Um, then there's a real-time 3D vision system, which takes about 50% of the brain performance. There's a 3D degree of freedom bending mechanism to extend the working area. There's an omnidirectional locomotion system with height compensation. So not too many robots actually able to go down uh, to do manipulation on the ground or then uh, reaching in the shelves. Um, and then have you collision-free path planning for arms and legs in real time, including balancing. There's an action planner in the event of falls. <laughs> so many things that can go. So it's a really complicated system. So vastly expensive. Um, and the question is then for human robot collaboration, I think we should really start simple. <laughs> and not with humanoid robots. So just one arm and suitable end of arm tools and moving the end of arm tools uh, along the, to the points or along the lines or surfaces that are, that are of interest. So screw fastening or gluing, and it's just one arm. It's not a humanoid. And then the processes which require most of the human capabilities should actually be carried out by humans and not by humanoids. I think um, otherwise you cannot um, produce um, uh, cost effectively. And the cost really is a major problem in introducing robots on the shop floor and uh, thinking about too complex uh, me mechatronic systems uh, would, would not work. What could be done is that we take the human performance as a benchmark for such a system. Um, so for the time being, um, Robot-based solutions uh, will, differ, will, will significantly differ from solutions made for humans. So when you think of a workplace that has been created for a human, and now you start off thinking, can I replace the human with the robot? No, that's not, that's not possible. Because this, this, this worker environment has been adapted to the human. You have to rethink the process uh, in order to have a, a cost-effective and, and uh, valuable uh, production system. I, I just ran across this company at, a, at an exhibition last week, so that's why I included them here already. Uh, so the company is called C-React. It's a startup in, in Germany, and they presented uh, a nice exhibit. They called it Pick GPT. And everyone is immediately uh, energized by hearing GPT, and now in combination with picking. So <laughs> what do they do? Uh, actually, it's, it's very simple, and I'm just wondering why the video is not running. So you, this is this is easy. So they have a prompt, an intuitive prompt. They're just saying here, I'm getting thirsty. Is there anything you can offer to me? And then, yes, I detected uh, something to drink. What do you want? 
So this kind of interaction, I think, is really simplified by, by what these large language models are offering us. It's a human-robot interaction, and I think this can be really easily integrated in any, in any type of, of human-robot interaction now. Um, and I, I like the demo. It, it was really uh, amazing to see that. And they had, they had another demo, so not only this one. Uh, let me go to the next page. I mean, this company is about bin picking, right? So you, you guessed it. And they just added the GPT uh, on top of it. And actually, it's not the Microsoft one. They told me it's an open source based one. So this is another one. So you just present a picture to the robot system. And then the robot is able to say, OK, I can pick this for you. Um, I've identified it. And um, when I was talking to them, they also told me what the system is also able to do. So you could tell the system, I have a headache. And then the system implies, OK, you might be helped with some aspirin. And they are taking the pills with the aspirin from the bin. So this, is, I hope, is maybe some inspiration for you how you can uh, do the interaction with robots in the future. So but again, I would like to repeat, AI alone is not enough. Um, there's still advances that we need in the electromechanic side maybe to be able one day to have um, a humanoid hands. Um, the thing is that all the components that we are developing are usually also made for lasting longer than just six months or 12 months. And if you are investing in a robot more than 1,000 euro, I think you also expect to run it for quite some time. But as a matter of fact, uh, your, your smartphones these days are also between 500 and, and 1,000 euro or US dollar. Um, how do you actually want to add a mechatronic to this? Because you need the computing power, at least of a smartphone, uh, to be able to run a robot. So it's, it's, for me, really critical to think about how, how cheaply can you build a robot and how useful can it then be for you in your, in your household. Um, so take it alone at an, at, an, at an industry. And I mentioned before the figure, so a robot cell today can still cost 100,000. Um, dollar. And that is because all the peripherals around it, it just takes money and there's so many actors involved um, in, the, in setting up a system and that this is also uh, one of the bigger problems. Um, and, and this is represented here on this slide. So there's millions of businesses that lack actually access to robotics, um, but robots are still an incredible productivity tool. So you see these kind of manufacturing sites. This is not at all um, a, a nice place to work. I don't know, for, for some of you maybe have been at mobile phone manufacturing uh, companies. So this is really, really, uh, it's, it's saddening <laughs> me in a way to see that, that people are actually working as robots uh, in these production lines. So um, the challenge today is if you still want to use robots, then um, you have to think about, they are expensive, they are inflexible today, and they require expert knowledge. Um, to make them useful. And as a result, because it's so complex to use robots, we still don't automate. So we are still using humans uh, in these workplaces. Um, and this also leads to the fact that some of these workplaces are really unhealthy and unergonomic. There's a couple of pictures here below. So people, I don't know if you, if you recognize this person here. So this person is sitting on a chair uh, and working overhead to do something here. This is a hull of an airplane. Um, and here also people working overhead underneath um, a car body. So these are very unergonomic uh, workplaces. They don't have to do some heavy lifting, but maybe five or 10 kilo, and you're doing this eight hours per day, uh, five days per week. After, after five years, these people have serious health problems. So this is something where, where, we, where we have to use robots in the future. And um, at, at least I'm hoping that something is changing. So if you, if you look back and, and see what's going on right now. Um, so in the 80s, we had the personal computing wave and then in the 2000s, the smartphones. And I strongly believe that now we are at the cusp of the revolution for industrial robotics. Um, and of course I have to say that because I'm from intrinsic <laughs> and our go-to-market approach is with manufacturing and with industrial robotics. What we are doing is we are democratizing the access to robotics. 
And what it means is all what I just said before. So we want to simplify the programming of robots. We want to simplify the deployment of robots, simulation of robots. So end to end from the design of robot work cells to the deployment of robot work cells. So this is what we mean by democratizing access uh, to robotics. And I just put a couple of videos here in this presentation. I hope this works now. Um, so this is what we what is already public on our website. So you can also watch the videos there. And this is a, a collaboration that has been ongoing for a couple of years with ETH Zurich. Um, they are they are building um, these. They are using robots for constructing parts of buildings that are really nice. So they just stack these parts on top of each other. And and our task in this project was to come up with an idea how you can actually orchestrate multiple robots that are hanging from the ceiling, uh, how you can simulate them um, that they are not colliding while bringing these work pieces together that are then uh, assembled. So it's a democratizing in the sense that we simplify the programming of multiple robots in a workspace without um, having them colliding. Uh, in the second example, this is about the assembly. So a, a huge untapped potential in robotics is in assembly. Um, and in assembly, um, you need robots that are sensor guided. You need perception technology. You need um, force torque sensing. And these two robots here, you know from KUKA, they have already integrated uh, force torque sensors. But still, it's very, very difficult to program these kind of applications. And at least we have the aim to simplify this. Uh, and what you see here has been uh, that's a that's actually a furniture that is available worldwide. Uh, it comes from IKEA. It's called uh, ICAT. We call this the ICAT demo. <laughs> and um, you see here these two robots assembling um, the ICAT um, box. And the third example um, is about how we can use actually machine learning for enhancing the motion of these robots. So it's about motion learning. Um, in the end, it will also be uh, about task learning. But let's, let, let's say again, start simple with motion learning. So this robot is learning a skill on how to insert connectors in sockets. And you see also various kinds of sockets, so USB sockets or VGA, which you might uh, need for uh, testing applications. And uh, the interesting or, or nice thing about being a startup with an alphabet is that you are able to get access to all this cool technology um, that is developed by all the other alphabet companies. So our company is quite small. We are, let's say, only in quotes 200 people. For a startup, it's already quite big. Um, we are backed by alphabet and we are able to collaborate with the best people in the ecosystem, and there's many, many more roboticists actually in the alphabet ecosystem available um, with whom we can collaborate. And as I said before, our target is industrial robotics. But this doesn't prevent us from thinking bigger. So this is a slide that, that I borrowed from uh, Open Robotics. And maybe you've heard that in uh, December last year, we um, intrinsic acquired um, the commercial branch of Open Robotics, OSRC, and uh, Matthew Festo, colleague of mine now, sitting here. So he's he's leading the Singapore team uh, of of Open Robotics, and of course, if you think this bigger from a from a platform perspective, if this works for industrial robots, of course it would also work for other robots. But as I said, we are a startup. We are starting small. We are going for an in industry uh, first. And then uh, let's see what's happened um, in the other sectors. But also to be sure, because that question will come, um, ROS, Gazebo, OpenRMF, these are all products that will be continue to, to be supported. So Alphabet has always been a very uh, strong um, supporter of open source. And I think this will be also for us uh, important in the future. Last slide. As I said in the beginning, I would like to invite all of you to our product keynote so that you know what we are doing and what will be our first um, go-to-market product. It's on May 15 uh, at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I know that's very bad time for you because it is 1 a.m. 
on May 16. <laughs> um, it's uh, for Europe, um, it's uh, 6 p.m. Uh, so for in, in Europe and then in, in California, it's quite good, uh, but here, unfortunately not. But still, if you register, um, you can watch the recording uh, later. Um, so I would like to ask you, if you're interested, please sign up uh, on the website. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I'm here to answer a little bit more questions. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Viskov. Uh, any questions for Dr. Viskov? Thanks for your talk. Just wondering, you said about the that kind of responsive collaboration that we all dream about between human and robot. Uh, it's too difficult, too expensive today. But in your effort in uh, to democratize access to robots, is that still uh, in your in one of your goals, or you consider that more of a, a scenario for social robots? While in manufacturing, we sh should still be keeping robots and humans separate? I, I think it's always a matter, if you can do it cost effective in manufacturing, it, it would be okay. But there's, I mean, we have cobots around so so many time now, and, and there has not been so many good applications in, in that respect. Because it, it's, you do not have an, an ROI in the end, a return of invest, that you have a human and a robot working at the same thing. What is happening is that of course, the workforce is reducing and you start really to replace some of these tasks with robots where you can do it. And the humans are then freed up to do other tasks that are still relevant. And um, there are so many studies out there that companies who employ robots actually create jobs. Net, they are not destroying jobs. So this is, this is really something um, where we all have to... Um, let's say, influence the public opinion in a way that companies who employ robots create jobs for humans because they increase their productivity and, and uh, yeah. But it's, it's difficult to justify the two working on one thing. So I'm interested. I'm interested in the Google robot, uh, Google Robotics. Uh, since they released the Palm E, so the uh, number of parameters is like 560 millions. So for such a huge model, uh, the robots can equip with various uh, abilities. For for example, science in the environment and have dialogues and pick and place. And I'm curious about uh, since such large models is really big, and in the future, how will such uh, large pre-trained models be used, be adapted into the human robots? And uh, what's your point of view for the outlook of such models in, uh, for example, the industry robots and so on? Thanks. I'm, I'm not an expert here, but what I would say is that um, what also will change in manufacturing that you have cloud access. And access to the cloud will allow you to have more compute power available. So then it's just about the communication channel between your robot or the worker and the servers somewhere around the world. Ideally, still in your country of origin <laughs> because of data privacy <laughs> reasons. So, but I think with compute power being available through the cloud, this will also change many things in manufacturing. And uh, talking to, again to the C-React company, um, they told me that they are using a much simpler publicly available open source large language model. Um, so they were able to integrate it and run it on, on the booth and on a standard PC. So the question is, given the challenges in trying to introduce robotics, how soon do you imagine before we can see robots helping us with common day-to-day -day tasks, e.g. clean toilets, uh, collect trolleys? And the second question, what are the biggest barriers and challenges we need to overcome to make this happen? Very good question. Um, I would like to maybe to, to, uh, to point you to Joseph Engelberger, 
And I think he wrote in the 80s a book called Robotics and Service. And there he depicted robots that should be available by the year 2000. And these robots were supposed to clean toilets, <laughs> for instance. So all the predictions that we have done in the past about what robots are able to do were wrong. Even the father of robotics, Joe Engelberger, was wrong. And I stopped in predicting things. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe George, <laughs> you're a wise man. <laughs> But usually you, you always say in 20 years, yes, no, but the 20 years, at least in my life, have already passed. So it's so a very difficult question, and I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot uh, answer. De definitely cost, cost is one element. Cost performance ratio. For the audience, I don't know how many people are online, but uh, just thought you mentioned about cognition and mechatronics. Can you elaborate a bit more on what is the vision? Uh, is it implementing, realizing some cognitive architecture or mechatronic, or is something else? I, I think it's it's what is meant is that you have um, better access to cognitive technology, so to AI, te to AI technology, and can control better mechatronic systems. It could, we couldn't add up in, in dual arm robots, why not? But maybe still in the beginning with simple grippers and not with two complex fingers. But this is something where you need in a dual arm system, you will already need some, some, some kind of motion planning. If you want to do assembly, you would need some kind of task planning. So how do you actually assemble an, an object? Um, and um, as we also have discussed yesterday, um, just presenting to a large language model learning system, a video stream of how these kind of um, objects could be assembled and the system is learning from it and you don't have to program it anymore. That would be for me a cognitive uh, mechatronic system. Thank you so much. Uh, 